When Pilate asked Jesus, are you a king? Jesus is reluctant to answer because Pilate's own idea of kings is so foreign to Jesus' own understanding of who he is himself. Kings were after lands, armies, powers, riches, fortresses. Jesus, who, came to, who, who claimed to be the sovereign leader of all nations, of all peoples, was after hearts hearts in the pursuit of a just and lasting peace on earth. The gospel message is that God in the person of Jesus has invaded our world to reclaim it and renew it. He comes to upend what is wrong and to establish what is right. The gospel tells us that through Jesus a new and living way has been opened that is far superior to the sacrificial system. And throughout the gospel writings, his disciples are told by a voice from heaven, listen to him. Today, when asked, Jesus responds to Pilate, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Last week, we heard the disciples, when they were leaving the temple, say to Jesus, look, teacher, what large stones and what impressive buildings. They were impressed by the size and seeming permanence of the building, and with good reason. Then Jesus responds with something that baffles them. Do you see these great buildings, he said? Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. And to his confused disciples, he predicts that the temple will be demolished. They know too little to ask anything except when. When will this happen? The leaders in Jerusalem at the time don't want to hear about the end of the temple. Not at all. It's their business. Just two days earlier, Jesus had enacted this ending of the temple when he vigorously overturned the tables of the money changers, as if to say, this way of dealing with God is over. His actions were a sign that the sacrificial system would cease to function which would, maybe not to our full understanding, have enormous economic consequences for the city, for all of Jerusalem, and especially for the religious people in power. The leaders in Jerusalem don't want to hear about the end of the sacrificial system. So three years into his ministry, which was a prophetic ministry, he was saying, this is what's going to happen if you keep heading down the road. Three years in, they've had it with him. It's not that they just wouldn't sit and listen to him to hear what he had to say. They hated him and much of what he stood for. These last few Sundays of the church year, we look at the end of things. Yes, we know that they're going to take Jesus' life, but is, is that the end of it? We know the answer, but the end here is not about an empty tomb and a risen Christ, but about Christ, who before the kings of the earth still stands. He's a sovereign ruler whose kingdom is not from here. And as this year ends and Advent begins, we begin again. We go back and hear Genesis to Revelation about the second coming of the Lord. In Advent, we get the full story, and there is more of this apocalyptic language. And it's like we get, we get to go back to Eden once again. What kind of God is this? What kind of Messiah is this? Destruction of temple, overturning tables, ruining exchanges. Last week I told you some things about my mother's situation in a memory care residence at the age of 88 and counting. She doesn't remember who I am to her, but her disposition remains a happy person who demonstrates warmth and love and talks a lot about feeling loved. My, my four siblings and I agree she's been a warm and contented person her whole life. My father, on the other hand, had a more complex emotional life. The five of us have very different views of my dad. One sister feels strongly that my dad was essentially an ego-driven taker. She interprets everything he did through that lens. Others of us see him more as a giver who when he was over-functioning, acted like a martyr. He was a very imperfect man. 
but I saw him, and still do, as a giver. He died suddenly in the year 1998 at the age of 69. Karen and I had three toddlers. One night, a few months after his death, when I was in bed somewhere between awake and asleep, you know that place, I had what I'd call uh, a visitation or a vision. And it was a gift. He came into our bedroom and stood very close to where I was sleeping. He didn't touch me, but he raised both hands and gave us a blessing. Couldn't hear the words, but I knew what was happening. He then, as I watched him leave our room, visited each of the three boys in their rooms and did the same thing. I've recalled this many times to memory. And the message I take is, I'm loved and blessed from beyond. The last part of my dad's life on earth was was marked by what I would call a vocation of blessing others. Unlike the first part of his life, the last part of his life, he looked for ways to bless. I wish that one sister would have such an experience. It seems most Jewish leaders saw Jesus in a negative light and couldn't see anything he did in a positive light. Everything he did was seen as taking things away from them. The problem, of course, wasn't Jesus' ego. It was theirs. Is the God of the Jews a giver or a taker? Is the God we worship a giver or a taker in your mind? Jews in power have two major problems on their hands as Jesus is in Jerusalem. The first is their own contempt for Roman occupation. They didn't just feel this. They actively showed it in resistance to Rome, saying from time to time, in effect, you can't make us, taunting the use of force. There were also many false messiahs stirring up the people, invading Roman authorities, saying things recklessly like, we'll fight you and we'll win. And they believed it because God was on their side. He was their God. They were proud nationalists, and they loved the language of winning. Who doesn't? Of their leaders, Jesus said they were the blind leading the blind. He told them plainly that they and their city were headed for trouble in their relationship with Rome. He said it very plainly. People in his day could feel the tensions rising. They knew he spoke to something very real. So 35 years in advance of the fall of Jerusalem... Jesus warns them of their perilous trajectory. You're headed for trouble. The second problem the leaders in Jerusalem had was that they showed the same resistance and hostility to God's messenger, Jesus, by actively shutting him out. And by shutting him out, they were shutting out the very help God was sending. The historian Josephus tells us of the terrible tale of how Jesus' prophecy would come to pass in A.D. 70, with the siege of Jerusalem. How would the city encircled by the Roman guard, the Jewish people starved, ate their own babies to stay alive, and fought each other for scraps of dirty food? During the siege, more Jews are killed by other Jews than by Romans. In AD 69, just before that, in the course of a year and a half, one emperor, Roman emperor succeeded another, four in all, Nero, Otho, Vitellius, and Vespasian. With each new leader came renewed violence, murder, and internal strife. As the year 70 began and Vespasian was on his way to Rome to receive the crown, his adopted son Titus entered Jerusalem, burnt the interior of the temple, destroyed the city, and crucified thousands of Jews. Had they heeded the voice of Jesus... Had they followed his counsel of peace, this could all have been avoided. Do you really think humanity has learned much since? We don't always welcome the truth. We love our modern day temples and rituals. We don't want our financial tables overturned. 
We have our ways of shutting out inconvenient truths. We don't easily give up power for anything. We are sometimes happy when a noisy truth teller is ignored, resisted, or even silenced, if it helps us. Christianity is not a spirituality advocating a special diet, herbal remedies, and a promise of comfort. High in the sky, by and by. It's a premise that the Creator God cares so much that He comes to alter and redeem history. And the ways of that God and His Christ are self giving. He comes not as an arrogant, egocentric deity, but with humility, self denial, and compassion. The Bible offers us a view of God's reign that differs radically from the reign of human monarchs and rulers. One example of how God's reign differs from that of earthly monarchs is that the baptized saints receive riches and power from God. Paul says in Ephesians, and Christ gave gifts. God comes as servant, as healer, the giver of bread, His self-offering and self-giving on the cross offers forgiveness to anyone who turns to him. He comes not to take away, but to remake us. And sometimes that requires something being taken away. Those who serve him are not promised an easy road, just as Jesus in his day judged the temple to be part of the problem, so too Jesus shall judge and purge all that stands against his sovereign reign. Christianity has much to say that comforts the poor and afflicted, but it's not for the faint-hearted. Next week, we hear John the baptizer crying out in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, he says. Today, where human societies and institutions set themselves up against the gospel and its standards, producing arrogant and dehumanizing structures, deep injustices and oppression, remember the Third Reich. Remember apartheid. Remember the Civil War. It's right there that these prophecies of birth pangs will find their way into our everyday news and history books. Who is this God? He's a righteous God. He's good. The judge of the nations. And his gift is this. Especially those who are suffering wrong. God's gift is this. Good will prevail over over evil when the story comes to its conclusion. Good will prevail over evil. When the temple fell in AD 70, it would be the sure sign that God had vindicated Jesus and his message. As a true prophet, he predicted it. As a true Messiah, he enacted it. His death was the end of his life, but the beginning of a new covenant of promise for all who will hear him. Predictions of endings can be off-putting. What helped Jesus' followers listen to and wrestle with his apocalyptic predictions was they saw his self-giving love. They felt it for themselves. They felt his care and concern for each. The disciples are told by a voice from heaven, This is my son. Listen to him. Jesus tells Pilate in this morning's gospel, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. How do we get to see God our Father in the right light? How do we get to see in the right way what's going on in history and around us in today's world? I hope you will see Advent as the church's gift to us. It's a season of endings and beginnings. I hope you'll pursue hearing the voice from heaven for yourself. If God asks you to lay something down, it's so he can give you something or give us something better. He's a giver. And know this, his supreme gift is your coming to know yourself as his beloved son or daughter. His truth and love are powerful. It'll topple buildings. 
It'll topple and re rebuild societies. It will heal brokenness. It can heal much of what ails our society. People who know their love are less apt to go off on a mash shooting spree. I hope you can see that the person who becomes part of this community of disciples of Jesus have no bragging rights, no sense of superiority over others, no wish to win at anything except the knowledge of God, the everlasting Father, and finding from Him a vocation to bless others.